You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Rowan, so I'm joined this afternoon by Pat Rowe and John Townley. I'm kind of going to go through our kind of thoughts on Brighton and then, like I said, look ahead to Southampton as well. Um, just before we started, John, you were kind of getting yourself set up and ready, walking around what sounds like a big room. So I know work from home isn't a novelty anymore, but I'm interested. Where, where are you? Is that a bedroom? Is it a living room? It seems like I, a big room to me. I am in my bedroom. I think it's just a lot of empty space. It's probably just like echoes to be fair. Yeah, you walked off to get something or turn the light <laughs> off and you were gone for like 10 right. minutes <laughs> in the same room. Uh, Pat, where are you? Is that a living room or a dining oh, room? I've got the... A desk in my bedroom where I usually work from, but that's got lighting issues for the podcast that mm-hmm. we found so frequently. So I go in the dining room for the podcasts. Lovely. And now that I've heard that you've got some building work. I mean, this is it relevant yeah, to the podcast, yeah. but some building work going on. So if there's yeah. any noise, that's what you can hear. Um, really let's talk <laughs> let's talk about Brighton then. Um obviously I've done a podcast with Ash on the match day itself, so forgive us if we're going over um, topics we've already talked about before. But you two haven't spoken on air about this since the win. So Pat I'll come to you first. Just your your general reaction to Villa winning a game. It felt good, didn't it? It was a it was a breath of fresh air and a relief at the same time, wasn't it? Uh it just felt like we went back to basics. It was reminiscent of the Palace game, wasn't it? The first Brighton game. I think we should just play Brighton every week, to be honest. It'd be all right. There'd be <laughs> you no know, panic anywhere. You know, one week we're talking about possible relegation scrap, and now there's a, people are looking back up the top of the table, aren't they? So looking forward, not backwards. But yeah, it was just a solid defensive performance. Sat back, didn't we? We didn't have much of possession, but that was always going to be the case against Brighton. We took our chance as well. Watkins, good to get back on the uh, score sheet, and just loads of positives to take from it, wasn't it? Solid performance. I think it had to be against the Brighton team that. A kind of renowned just again one one draws most weeks. Um yeah, back to basics. Change of formation as well. Obviously having the two uh, strikes up front, two hard working strikes and Watkins Watkins and Ings up top. Um yeah, but positive performance. I don't think there's don't want to be negative, but I don't think there's too much you can take from it. I think it's good for confidence. Um yeah. going into games against like Southamptons and I don't know like Wolves and Arsenal in the next few weeks as well. Um they're gonna be completely different games. So I think Gerard's going to have to be quite flexible over the coming weeks um, to kind of keep that momentum going. But no, a positive result. And so I think we took take the chance. We took the chance as well. Sorry that we had because I think it would have probably been a very different game if Cash didn't score inside the first you know thirty minutes and we don't get a second goal. Um, you know, a very good time in the second half as well um, to sort of double your advantage. So um, yeah, positive uh, result more so than performance. I would. Probably suggest the two nines versus the two tens. I guess from previous mm-hmm. weeks, we've talked all season about Watkins and Ings not working as a duo, and then we switch to a formation that gets them both playing there together, and we win. Now Watkins does score, but doesn't have a great game. Danny Ings doesn't really do anything. So I don't want to talk specifically about the eleven just yet. But what do you do in regards to formation? Do you stick with those two and the two nines? Or do you kind of think we're wasting Buendia sat on the bench? It's a temperamental thing at the moment, isn't it? If it's not broke, I don't know if we uh, try and fix it. But uh, as you said, Watkins and Ings, it wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. Like There's games where you think, oh, we've been terrible, we've done nothing. But Watkins get on the score sheet, that's just a positive you're going to have to take from them playing together. You've got to probably say, okay, maybe they can. So it's still not clear is it, is it, if it can happen like completely together at the moment. But I, I wouldn't be changing anything ahead of the Southampton game. I thought the midfield looked a lot more balanced with those two ahead of them and Coutinho slotting in between. It's a shame that Wendy got dropped, to be honest. I think in, in the poor performance we've had as a team in recent weeks, I think Wendy has been a bright spark throughout. I think he had like four key passes against uh, Watford. So the only real bright spark there. But he dropped out and obviously you're going to have to play Coutinho on him. It's Coutinho, so you can't not play him. But um, And I can't see Gerard dropping him either. So yeah, I wouldn't make any changes, I think. It's going to be a difficult test this weekend. It could be similar to the, South, uh, the Brighton game, to be honest. I don't know if we'll dominate the ball this weekend. So it could be a very, it could unfold in the same way that um, the Brighton game did. And like John said, if we score early, then maybe we can just hold out with a solid defensive performance. Well, let's hope it's not like the reverse Southampton fixture. That was great. Yeah, um, that was full back, the, the fullbacks were deeper against Brighton. Now, obviously, there's yeah. been a lot of talk about fullbacks bombing forward in Gerard's system. And I mean, Cash does score, so it kind of seems counterintuitive to say that they were a little bit further back when he was the goal scorer. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much do you think that affected the win, Pat? 
it seemed like they were just a lot deeper in like the build up play as well. So there was more people, like a, a bigger, a better option for like Mings or Conza to look to or Emmy Martinez to look to from the back, and we could just build up a bit uh, more balance in a more balanced way. Um, in terms of cash getting forward, I, a lot, I don't know what the actual fact of it is, or but I'd like to see where Digne was at. Uh, Dean was at that point in time because it felt like against Watford they were both just bombing forward and we were getting caught on the counter attack. Be interested to see if like Dean was back while Cash was going forward, and they were kind of operating on that steering wheel I was on about in the last uh, yeah. preview to that one. But yeah, it just I think someone posted the heat maps of the individual players as well, and it just showed that like predominantly both of them were in their own uh, in the, in our half. So I think they were a lot deeper. It gave us a lot more cover, and also meant that the likes of Ramsey was in a, a better position going forward. He wasn't covering for them. McGinn was back to his best as well, I thought. And I think his average yeah. position was closer to cash and like was a bit deeper. So he was offering the defensive support. And I thought, yeah, he was back to his best completely. Like the tenacity he usually brings going forward, picking passes, dribbling out of uh, difficult situations, just relieving pressure, to be honest. But yeah, I thought we were a lot more comfortable in possession. And a lot of that was because the uh, fullbacks were deeper and there was a more, more options for us to look at. Yeah, I think... You kind of need to take it a little, little bit into account that obviously we've gone a goal up against the Brighton team that just say don't score many goals. I think if that's a Leeds or a different team that's probably going to come at you throughout the game um, and leave open space, then you probably would see a cash or a Dean sort of stay higher and there'll probably be more space between um, the midfield as well, just you know for counter-attacking purposes. Um, but no, I think, again, I think it's just the game plan against Brighton that worked really well. Um, I echo everything that Pat said, I think, for that game specifically. You know, we execute it really well and you come away with a 2-0 win, uh, which not many teams do, to be fair. As I say, it's Brighton who draw many games um, and we're taking six points off them as well. And I don't know if there'll be another team that do that this season, maybe Liverpool and Bright, uh, sorry, Man City. Um, so Gerard's done Grand Potter twice, really. Uh, but again, against the team, I think you'll be seeing a different sort of style, a different um, game plan, obviously. But I think Gerard just sticking to that 4-3-3 in the first, maybe two months, even three months um, of his tenure so far, I think, I don't know. I think being more flexible has definitely helped in the last couple of weeks. I think we've seen it. Yeah. Um, well, say last couple of weeks in the last game, sorry, but in the weeks going forward, being more adaptable. Um, for example, against Southampton, I, I might want to see McGinn maybe sit deeper and be that assurance with Louise. So you've got a um, sort of, you know, mitigating that ball between Ward Prowse or Romeo to the two uh, front players. Because um, we have so much quality going forward in a Buendia, Bailey, Coutinho and Ramsey or Watkins and Ings. You almost let them do their thing. And I'm, I'll be the first one to say I want John McGinn to be bombing forward. But in a game against Southampton, you, you know, looking at how we were in that 4-3-3, we were very open in terms of spaces between the midfielders and against Southampton who are going to flood the middle of the park. I think that'll be a, be a problem for us. So I'd like to see us be more conservative like we were against Brighton. But then again, at home, you're always going to have opportunities to break with the ball and use the ball in the final third. And when you've got so much quality, as I say, I think you're going to, you know, get plenty of chances to score goals. It's about more cons- uh, stopping them at the other end, I suppose. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where I stand on it to be honest, because you see a lot of things from kind of ex pros and like high le- high end players talk about. You know, these these elite managers will play the same way no matter what. Set up mm-hmm. to play their game against the opposition and not kind of take take the opposition into account. Yeah. I think at a lower level, not obviously we're still in the Premier League, but we're not on elite side. You do have to yeah. adapt to the size that you're playing, and it's it kind of borderlines on. Yeah, well, yeah, it, well, exactly. It, it kind of borderlines on stubbornness, doesn't it? If you're not yeah. willing to change it for a certain opponent, now, just because we won with a with two nines playing against Brighton, Br- Br- if we do go back to the two tens against South uh, against Southampton and we win that game. We'd be talking next week about oh which formation is best at A or B, but they both worked in different situations, didn't they? And you have to have that flexibility to to bring success. I think. Just speaking about Southampton, I think um, they're like the main like point of their like attack and their, the way they play is just the, their ability to apply a press. I think they're fourth in uh, presses in the attacking third. Uh, 232 high turnovers, which is like turnovers within 40 meters of the opponent's goal. 45 of those lead to shots, which is second in the Premier League, third for pressures in midfield, fourth in the attacking third, and fourth in success rate. So I think I'm not as much worried about what's going to happen in like the front four or front three or whatever, but I think we should stick with the same system at the back, which is the uh, like Dean and Cash dropping a bit deeper, McGinn being there to receive the ball as well, Louise being there to receive the ball. Because I have a feeling as we try and build it from the back, they're just going to press us relentlessly. Like Shea Adams, I think Brower. 
Uh, and then they've got the midfield of Ward Prowse and Romeo. They're just going to be running relentlessly as well. So I think it's important. I, I don't know what he's going to do with the if he'll stick with the two up top or go with Watkins on form, Coutinho and Buendia if they come back in. But for me, it'd be the back five, which is more important, and then like the midfield dropping deep to come and relieve the pressure a bit. Because if they pen us in, I think they obviously they turn it into shots. So that's probably the way they're going to look to punish us. Just on Southampton, they're playing West Ham tonight in the FA Cup. Do you think that will be any kind of factor to play? Obviously, we've not played a midweek game, which is annoying in some in some aspects from, from a fan perspective. So I would quite like to still win the FA Cup yeah. at this point. Obviously, watching Middlesbrough last night kind of play our our route to the final, if you, if you like, with them beating our opponents, Man United, and beating Spurs last night. I watched that. I think oh, I'd love to still win the FA Cup. Uh, but obviously, no midweek game, for, midweek game for us. There is one for Southampton, John. Is that going to be a factor, do you think, in terms of fitness and, and match sharpness and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, it will because they're playing a game in midweek, I suppose. But I do think that, you know, and of, of how much will that affect the game on Saturday? Probably not too much. But yeah, I, I guess they're going to have players that are going to be uh, running more, training less through the week, I suppose. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't take too much into account. I think, I don't know how much. Um, Southampton are going for the FA Cup, how much th- changes they've made previously in the uh, other rounds, but I presume you'd probably play probably your strongest team now um, at this sort of later stage in the competition. Uh, but we know Southampton don't change their team too much um, in the Premier League. It seems to use the same sort of tactics as well, Hassan Hull in every game. I think there was a report that said or found out that they always got substitutions or no, a player would they always... They went down injured, didn't they, or something? Yeah, yeah like around the hour mark. Um which seems to be quite fishy. So um, they've got their ploys and their strategies to kind of maximise that uh, their players' um, fitness or energy level. So um, he's probably got it all planned out. And me commenting commenting on it probably is a bit irrelevant, <laughs> considering they've got all those planned <laughs> tactics going on. But, um, no, I, I, yeah, I think we're quite 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 a fit bunch as well now. Since Jared's come in, that was one of the first demands that he asked of his players to get to get much fitter. And I think that's starting to show too. And grinding out results that like we did against Brighton. Um, if we're going to continue to do that throughout the season, then you've got to stay um, fit throughout the game and mentally fit as well. And that's what Southampton have done in the last like ten games, losing like once yeah. I think, um, and scoring plenty of goals as well. So I actually quite like that thing Southampton do when they have a player go down injured to go a little reset and a drinks break or whatever. Like some people will look at that and go, "It's kind of cheating or whatever," but it's, no, no rules no against. It. I mean. Yeah. Having well, said that, if we're if we're one 0 down at that point on the hour mark, well, the mark and they're doing it there, and if someone's feigning an injury, we're going, "Oh, get him off, get him off." Your thoughts, Pat, on Southampton? They're they're danger, man. I guess, or they're they're the areas that we should be um, concerned about them exploiting us. Yeah, uh, in terms of their FA Cup game tonight, I just thought I just want to see their bur- uh, their bubble burst a bit. To be honest, I think what is it undefeated in the last six games or like ten? Or one, one, what? Yeah. And then they look for a third win in a row in the Premier League and they love coming to Villa Park for some reason. They're undefeated in the last six. Last win in 2004 for Villa. So I was in year two, year six. I didn't think I got glasses until year three, so I was just walking around blind <laughs> <laughs> at this point in time. Um, but yeah, the danger men, which is another bad point, is Shea Adams, ex Bluenos. I can't remember if he scored against us. I've erased all Southampton games from my mind, but probably has. Uh, bro, yeah, James Ward Prowse from free kicks. I can't forget that 4 3. That makes me feel sick if he gets a free kick on the edge of the box. But there is a glimmer of hope for us, and that is I'm taking my girlfriend and her dad. And the last game she went to it was her first game, was the 3 0 win against Everton. The first game she watched was the 7 2 win against Liverpool. So she's a bit of a good luck charm. So. If anything's going to break the curse, it's this weekend. So I've got to say, I just love that little one minute segment or something I've just given you there because I, I come to you, I knew to on this podcast because you, you do all the reports, you got your stats, your analysis, all this kind of stuff. I come to you there, Pat, asking about danger men and key areas which you can be concerned about. <laughs> and I find out that you didn't get glasses till year three, that your girlfriend's <laughs> going to a second game, like pretty much useless information, but good, good podcast go. material. So I'll take that. I think most people are kind of consider them to have had a, a pretty good season overall. They you know, they're kind of on an upward trajectory, they've got a good manager, a good setup there. I was looking for the, the league table just to see their their results before we came on to this. They got thirty five points and they're ninth. Now they're unbeaten in five, which kind of will a bit of recency bias there will think, oh they're on a good run, they're doing well. But they're five points ahead of Villa. Which considering some people would think that Villa have had a pretty rubbish season really and, and aren't really going anywhere. Five points separating the two teams, potentially two points separating the two teams. Come come five o'clock Saturday, if, if Villa win, yeah. 
are Southampton that much of a concern to be worried about, John? In terms of finishing the top 10, I'd probably say so, because I think the next games are... Uh, I don't know them by hand, but I play like five games in a row against teams that are all below them, I think, like your Leeds and Norwiches and Watfords, I believe. Um, but yeah, I mean, t- to be fair, I thought they would be in the relegation mix this season when we signed Danny Ings. Um, and obviously they had the whole James Ward prowl situation, which lasted up until the very end of the window as well, if you we remember. Um, yeah. So to be fair, my uh, expectations of them were pretty low. I think they sold Vestergaard as well, who was quite good for them last year. Hasn't been so good this year for Leicester. Um so I expect them to be right down there, uh, but to be fair, they've completely um, proved me wrong. I think that I think you said they've done in the last month or two. The season's quite season's changed quite drastically. They were 15th, yeah. 14th, but their really good form up until now has um, kind of shot them up the league a little bit. Um, but again, if you look at the fixtures that are coming up, as I say, they've got teams that are all below them, but they're probably tricky games now, aren't they? In the business end of the season, and if you look at where we were a couple of weeks ago, saying our oh, new. <laughs> Saints, Brighton, teams that we got Leeds as well coming up soon. Um, we were thinking like nine points out of 12 or whatever and we've had, uh, and we lost both to Watford and Newcastle. So who, who knows? But I think as long as we do our business um, on the pitch, then we'll be okay. Uh, I just think this weekend will be a tough game to be fair and I think it'll be probably got a draw written all over it. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Their, their next few fixtures are after us, uh, Newcastle, Watford, Burnley and Leeds and then Chelsea, Arsenal. So there's a bit of a tricky run coming up as well before the season ends. You've got Liverpool, Leicester still to play. So yeah, they're, they're definitely up in that, in that top 10, I think. And that's probably who we're competing with. But if you beat them this weekend, that, that does change the landscape a little yeah. bit. And yeah, just it's that expectation of Southampton have a good season and then you look at it and think, well, it could be two points behind them come Saturday night. Yeah. That's not that good really. That game you mentioned there Pat uh, Southampton last one in 2004 for the people that are watching live a little, little quiz a little lunchtime quiz um, who are the goal scorers now I, we know because we've seen you posted the stats so I know who it was I wasn't there either I was only nine I think I didn't start going properly till kind of 2006-ish so that game was before my time as well John you're similar age to Pat are you you're younger as well um, I am. I was about to say I was four. I, I am four years old. Uh, I'm <laughs> three, two now. Um, I would have been four uh, when you're we played. Four. When what month did we play then? Hang on a minute. You you're younger than Pat. How old are you? Uh, I'm ninety eight. What? You're ninety eight. Oh. Well, that's old. Nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety eight is in the year born. Yeah. Uh, how old? Are you, when were you born, John? I'm two thousand. Bloody hell. Okay. All right. It's easy for me. It's easy for me with the dates though. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so if anyone wants to have a guess at that, that would be uh, would be nice. Changes to Villa's eleven, then. You know, the, the old adage is don't change a winning team. Are we both? Are we both saying that's the case? I think Ash has got his predicted eleven. I, don't, I haven't got it to hand, but I'm pretty sure he's he's gone for an unchanged team. You said that you wouldn't. Yeah. John, are you going to throw a curveball at me? Any changes? The thought of having two strikers up front without too much width at home does. I don't know. I can just envisage we're in like the 55th minute or 60th minute, and it's a bit. I don't know. But I, yeah, it's mainly just a feeling in my head. Um, I would go with the Martinez, Cash Conts and Mings, then uh, Luca Dane. But I would have Douglas Luiz sitting with McGinn. Not necessarily sitting, but just being that screen between the midfield and um, Southampton's midfield and the tax, as Pat says, they've got so many turnovers and they're pressing so high. I just think we need more bodies there because we all know what it's like. You've got Tyron Mings and Conts are just looking forward, trying to play those forward balls. And then it's just Louise kind of hovering in that number six position and there's nothing mm. much going on. But I have two in there. Jacob Ramsey is a 10. Uh, Coutinho on the left and Wendy on the right, um, bringing Bailey off the bench and Danny Ings off the bench if needed as well with Watkins up front. I uh, just think it gives us a bit more um, fluidity about us. And Southampton, again, they're so... To come across as if they're doing their homework almost like 24 hours a day. I can imagine Hassan Hüttel depicting everything that happened in our last game. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'd change it up a little bit. But, hey, if it's the same team, then I think there'll be a pretty similar outcome, to be fair. I think it'll be a very cagey game. I'd like to just try and play with a bit more expansion um, in the wide areas if we can. The consensus among the comments seems to be that Dan Ings has to play. So he kind of needs a bit of a run here. So, John, you've yeah. just dropped him. So, thank, thanks for, for <laughs> segueing into the next segment. Um, surely Ings has to play, says Rob. How many times do old players come back to haunt you? Which is, yeah, that's fair. Josh Kirk that's says right. Bailey could also come on four Ings and then you can stick with the same formation and have Bailey playing up front effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, Daniel says, I think Luke needs a run. Uh, appreciate Watkins got a goal, but with Wendia, Coutinho and Bailey should mean Dan Ings would thrive. And yeah, on paper, that 
makes sense as it's been a nice little system, doesn't it? I suppose the one then, just to kind of end, because we haven't got all day to um, chat about Villa, unfortunately, the curious case of Morgan Sants on what happens with him uh, we always talk about changes for the team every week. We do these graphics saying, you know, what change would you make? And everyone says, Sanson, Sanson, Sanson. We'll do a tweet saying, should Sanson start next week? And everyone's, yes, yes, yes. And then the same news comes around from Stephen Gerrard and he's nowhere near it. Doesn't even come off the bench. Um, I don't, I, I don't think it's the last game. Yeah, it's the one before. He, he was struggling. Yeah, he, he doesn't come on then. So how do you assess, I don't know whether you two have spoken about this recently, how do you assess Morgan Sanson's future at Villa, effectively, John? Because if he's not getting game time, he's not going to want to stick around, is he? Yeah, and I don't see that changing. Um, I really like Morgan Sanson, and I think it's a shame that he's just going almost way back to the start. It's a shame that he had those injuries under Smith because back then he was playing most games, and I think he'd be a, um, a consistent feature in the team at the start of this season as well. Um, and then Gerard, we know Gerard likes him. Gerard says, uh, I asked him actually about him, and he said that he watched him or he played against him when the Rangers played a pre-season game against Marseille and he said that he was one of the best players there and he, he basically reassured him when he first came into the club, Gerard, that um, Sanson would have been part of his plans and that he's got a future at the club. But he's, he might have a future at the club because it suits Villa to have a player of Morgan Sanson's quality on the bench. But if you're Morgan Sanson, you're not, you, you don't want to be on the bench at Villa um, because although we're all saying, oh, we've got a big plan in place, we've big ambitions that in five years maybe we might be in Europe, Morgan Sanson will be like, what, 31 or 32? with probably like 20 more Premier League appearances or something by that time. Um, so it's not really, it's not good for him. He's got a career to chase. And at the moment, we're just a mid-table Premier League team. Um, and I'd also argue that I can't see him getting any game time because simply, I don't think he plays number six in terms of what we want. Um, so he's not going to be replacing Douglas Louise or a new uh, defensive midfielder when he comes in in the summer. Uh, he's not going to be displacing John McGinn because that's just not going to happen um, under Steven Gerrard. Whether fans want to see it or not, it's not going to happen. And then Jacob Ramsey as well is probably one of the first names on the team sheet because you need that. Um, again, Santon can play that role, I think, but Jacob Ramsey is going to play every game. So the midfield just seems so set to me already. Um, so I can't see any game time from there. Again, I think if you look at a Carney Chuck maker coming off the bench, that makes sense because... It's a player that we want to try and tie down to a new contract and offer him game yeah. time and sort of prove um, our promise, should we say. Uh, but with Sanson, there's um, there's a player there that you'd love to have at the club when we're in Europe, for example, in a few years' time, hopefully. Um, but you can't just keep him kind of, not like a prisoner, but he is sort of <laughs> not there, isn't he? Is he going to be playing games for any of the... Well, not any of the Premier League team. For most of the Premier League teams, he's going to be playing in France at probably the highest level as well. Um, so for me, it sounds a bit silly that he'd just be sticking around. It doesn't suit him. And to be fair, in the summer, you could probably get a decent fee for him as well. Probably get your money back. So when he got him for, what was it, 15 million? Yeah. Probably get your money back around that. Um, it, it's just a shame. I just can't see him breaking into the um, first team 11 anytime soon. I'm asking you to join me in speculating here, Pat, with uh, absolutely no insight at all. Uh, don't go to body more, don't see the players, don't know anything, neither of us do. Mm-hmm. So from a podcast point of view, this is just us as fans chatting as here's my maybe a, a, an option for what's going on. Potential attitude problem with Sanson maybe. You know, Stephen Gerald said that he likes him and then doesn't really yeah. get a kick. There's been two managers now at Villa who have not chosen to play him really. I know he's had his fitness concerns, but still not had the game time. He, he probably could. He has been fit for a little bit now and still isn't getting much of a look in. Yeah. Is that a possibility that there's maybe a bit of a problem there with him as a personality? Yeah. Um, you know, well, there was that moment where he'd, he'd kick a water bottle or something when he came off or yeah, I don't really that. when he came off against United and then his face when we were in the Newcastle game and Carney came on ahead of him and when we needed like a bit of control in the game. Same for Watford. It doesn't look that great, but I can understand him being annoyed at it. Gerard hasn't really revealed anything as he said he likes him, so I can't... I don't know. It would just be speculation saying he's got an attitude problem. It? I think it's just unfortunate that his position isn't the holding midfielder, so he isn't really competing with Louise, although people want to see him there. And I've said I want to see him at least trialled there before last week's mm-hmm. game. He's competing with Jacob Ramsey and John McGinn, and you'd like to think John McGinn is irreplaceable, or in Gerard's eyes, he's irreplaceable. Jacob Ramsey, there's no point dropping him because he's in the form of his career currently. He's getting better every single week. So he's just competing with arguably... What two of the strongest names on the team sheet that probably go first for Gerard, to be honest. Yeah. This is a really difficult situation for him. And um, 
yeah, I, I can't see his future line here, to be honest, if nothing else changes. The very last thing I want to mention, because I know you two have got to go back and do some actual work, uh, the Villa accounts, John, I'm going to come to you for this, because I've not really looked into it. I know that you've written a piece about it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't imagine you're going to have the fullest gra- grasp on this, but just a general yeah. overview. Is it good news or bad news? Um, I did study business at A-level, so I'm clearly qualified oh. to talk about this. Uh, no, I think mainly the, the takeaways are that you're looking at two different coronavirus periods. First one being the 29 account, 2019 accounts, now 2020 accounts, both hit by COVID um, disruptions. So our losses in 2019, as far as I know, were about 100 million. And now they've been uh, reduced to about 36, which is presumably good news. Um, still 36 million pound of losses. Though. And then our 38 million pounds for losses, sorry. And then our uh, revenue has gone up to 71 million pounds. Uh, sorry, but I can't count that. I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, seventy one million pounds of um, of revenue. So that's um, good news as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Let's just call it there. I just enjoy making you squirm a little bit there. Uh, Villa, since we've been doing this podcast, Villa have done a massive article about their plans yeah, for the future. Yeah. And, the North uh, Stand, they're redeveloping the North Stand. Yeah, it's redevelopment plans for the North Stand is going to be uh, in the works at some point, in a city academy at some point. Um, so, yeah, more on the Villa website if you want to go and read that and then some analysis of those developments on the Birmingham Live website from John, you later, I imagine, because it looks like you're about to go and do some serious work. So I'll let you both go. Thank you very much for joining me on this podcast right, as please. ever. We'll be back on Saturday evening for a post-match chat about Southampton. Yeah, definite three points for Aston Villa. You heard it here first. Thanks for all the comments for joining in as always and uh, we'll see you on Saturday. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode, but until then, up the villa. Up the villa.